But now I'm very pleased to welcome our first panel of the day to the stage and introduce John Shepard. John's a board member, as you all know, and he will moderate this panel. He's been co-chair of the Synthesis and Legacy Committee since it was conceived. He and Rick Shaw have done a brilliant job of orchestrating this with along the rest of the board. So John, we look forward to hearing what's next. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. It feels a bit like an Oscars ceremony, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry I'm not wearing a fancy dress. Um, we have the now two um, panel discussions, uh, and we're really starting at the bottom of that list of core areas. So we're starting with uh, knowledge exchange with the user communities. And there, this is a very subtle and carefully constructed title, and I want to point out two things. Firstly, it says knowledge exchange, not knowledge transfer, because this is very much a two-way process of talking and listening. Uh, we are producing in the Gomri program a massive amount of information, and we want to communicate that to the user communities but we also want to listen to their perspectives. And over the last few years, we've been concentrating on that uh, more than we did in the early days when it was a question of getting the research underway. And the second point is that it's user communities, plural. Uh, there is not just one user community, there are many. And we have essentially five of them represented here today. Uh, this first panel is, if you like, with the professional user communities, uh, namely um, the industry, um, the private sector responders, uh, government agencies, and NGOs. And then the second panel, which will follow this one, is talking to the much more wider general public, uh, non-professional user communities. So we have uh, taken, we have um, this core area eight uh, doesn't function like the other core areas, it functions as an advisory group. Uh, and uh, we have invited four members of that group to come and share their thoughts with us. And they are not representing their organizations, uh, they are representing uh, broadly the user communities from which they come. Uh, and they are uh, uh, Chris Robbins, representing the um, NGO community, Tom Coolbar representing the uh, oil extraction industry, uh, Paul Schuler representing the private sector uh, responders, and uh, Lisa DePinto representing government agencies. Uh, and we have set them a, a task, um, which is to say, in just a few minutes each, uh, what are the good things and the bad things about Gomri? What are the things you really like and what are the things that we could have done better? And this is completely unscripted, so I have to say I have no idea what they're going to say, um, but I hope it's going to be mainly positive, but I'm sure there are going to be some interesting and constructive suggestions for the future. And we will then have, hopefully, about 15 minutes for discussion with you all uh, to get your views and uh, your questions about this whole issue of knowledge exchange with the user communities, how, how did Gomri do, and what could we do better? So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Chris Robbins to speak on behalf of NGOs in general. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I went out and canvassed my colleagues in the NGO community to get their perspectives on, on Gomri's performance. And so this represents a bit of a synthesis of, of sort of what they told me. So these, these views are only my own, uh, really, but uh, they reflect some of the thoughts of my colleagues in the NGO community. So the first thing that, that was clear to us was that, that Gomri was just an incredible opportunity to invest in, in basic science. Um, I think that all of us in this room will agree that there was just a lack of, of baseline environmental information about the Gulf. Um, and we had this parallel process at the time called Natural Resource Damage Assessment, NERDA. John, John mentioned it, and NERDA's focus was really on, on documenting the, the magnitude and nature of the harm. And it didn't, it didn't really, it wasn't in its wheelhouse to collect baseline data. 
And so Gomery really went beyond what, what NERDA could, could do. Um, and it greatly accelerated our, our understanding of the Gulf through the collection of baseline data, hypothesis-driven research, and we have a much better understanding of the biota and ecology of the Gulf today thanks to the studies of people like Mandy Joy and her team and Steve Borowski, Dean Grubbs, Dave Hollander, and it goes on and on and on. Um, also, in, in, I would say in the weeks and months and years after the spill, the public was just really hungry for, for information and insights into, into the harm. And uh, it was at a time when NERDA was largely opaque and dark due to ongoing or the potential for, for litigation. And so the, the public really got its first glimpse uh, into the impacts of the spill through the publication of, of Gomery findings. Um, so it really played a key role in helping the public understand the science uh, of an oil spill. And I will also say that, that Gomery um, provided some key gap funding. Um, the NERDA process uh, essentially uh, wrapped up and sort of left many studies undone. And so um, this Gomery stepped up and, and sort of funded um, the continuation of studies in places like Barataria Bay with respect to bottlenose dolphins. Um, and I also will say that Gomery gets extremely high marks for being collaborative and interdisciplinary and competitive and, and requiring you know, researchers to come together to team up um, to do the best possible science that invited or allowed um, internationally scientists to participate in the process to bring the bear of their expertise on, on Gulf ecosystem science, oil spill science, et cetera. And I will also say that uh, Gomery did an amazing, admirable job in terms of creating a transparent, publicly accessible um, data portal uh, through Grid C. And I think that represents an opportunity for others to emulate. And this has been said, but I'm going to say it again. I mean, Gomery has invested uh, in the next generation of scientists by encouraging the involvement of students in consortia. It's just so rewarding, gratifying to walk through the, the poster hall and see all these posters of, of um, research of various you know, grad students, even undergrad students, et cetera. Um, my only, I think, criticism is that you know, in the early days of Gomery, there was this perhaps disproportional emphasis on, on the research of physical processes and not so much the, the ecology of the Gulf. And I think that was a missed opportunity. And when there was more of an emphasis on biology, it was more on microbial you know, communities and not necessarily the megafauna. Um, birds, marine mammals, uh, sea turtles, et cetera, and some of the top predators. Um, and, and lastly, I will say that communications is very important. As a science-based advocacy organization, we would really like to see the application of the science being, being collected and being learned and transferring that knowledge to the decision-making community. And so that, that's really, really critical. And I think Gomer did a pretty good job in that respect, but I think there's always room for improvement. So thank you very much. Those are my overarching comments. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, please write your questions and uh, comments on the cards and wave them in the air. Somebody will come and collect them and bring them up the discussion uh, that will follow. Uh, so next up is uh, Tom Kulbar um, on behalf of the uh, oil industry itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's kind of a daunting position to take. Uh, it's, there are several things I'd like to talk about, but one thing I will point out is, so I've been with ExxonMobil now for 32 years. My 32nd anniversary was February 1st. So I'm actually in my 33rd year, which is just hard for me to believe. A large part of that over the last 13 years has really been the science of oil spill response. So when we had the opportunity to start interacting through um, the Gomery initiatives, it's really been very good because the perception that we still get from time to time is that there's a real divergence and sort of a wall between the oil industry science and the academic research that's been going on. So, the challenge that industry has had, and I can speak on behalf of the wider community because I'm in that position where I get to work with the broader oil industry. The enviable thing about oil spill response, emergency response is we don't compete. So I'm in rooms with Shell, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, BP on a regular basis. So I think I can speak for all of us in some way. 
The challenge we had when Gomery was first started was the fear that we had that the academic community might not recognize that there had actually been a fair amount of science around oil spills that had been going on. As John Farrington mentioned, there actually has been a, a pretty robust history of trying to understand what's happened and how to actually learn from that. So for me, it was a great opportunity, and I know I can talk uh, about my first interactions with Chuck Wilson uh, about the, the frustration we had at not necessarily having a seat at the, the Gomery table in, in some ways. So from that very first interaction, we started working pretty well together to the point where there's an organization that we have that's called the Industry Technical Advisory Committee that meets every year. It's an oil spill response uh, coordinated effort that Oil Spill Response Limited, which Paul can talk about, actually coordinates. But we invited Gomri to come to that very early on so at least we could have the academic and industry interactions. And there was a very successful meeting that we had in uh, New Orleans at Tulane a number of years ago. I can't even remember exactly when it was. Chuck probably knows, but it was a, a start of a really good relationship, and we've tried to leverage that ever since, even to the point where I just realized that on my name tag today, I forgot to stick my executive committee little banner on it, because I am part of the Gomery, the Go Moses Executive Committee, which, again, it's taken years to get there, and I think as Chris mentioned, if we could have started doing some of that earlier, it's been that 10-year road where we really do have that good interaction but it's taken a while. So I think we're at a point now where we could probably get that up and running a lot more quickly. But we do have these interactions through ITAC. Uh, we have had one of those sponsored at Woods Hole several years ago. To me, that was one of the best ones we ever had. Um, this year coming up, it's gonna be in Nova Scotia. It's gonna be uh, hosted by the MPRI, the Multi-Partner Research Initiative, Ken Lee, who we've seen a lot. He's not here today. Uh, but we interact very broadly with government, with academia, with industry. And we could do that better, but we will keep doing it. And the relationships we've built over the last 10 years, I think, are things that will continue. So now we do understand who is out there doing research, whether it's academically or industrially. Uh, and we just have to keep interacting as much as we can. And the one thing I really want to highlight is the, uh, again, the uh, academic versus industry, but from the upcoming researchers. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being part of the, what was called the CMEDS Consortium, the Consortium for Molecular Engineering of Dispersant Systems that was organized and run primarily through uh, Tulane, LSU, University of Texas, Austin, uh, Minnesota, and University of Rhode Island. So I get to work with the professors in a, a bunch of different disciplines, and most recently I was invited to come and give a talk last spring at URI to the engineering group to talk about what oil spill response is from the industry standpoint. A graduate student came up to me at the end of that to just sort of talk about what we do, and I've had a chance to work with her as she went through her PhD thesis. She's since got it, and now she's a postdoc in Madison, Wisconsin, and she's actually a co-author of a poster that we're giving at the International Oil Spill Conference that's coming up in New Orleans in May, and she's gonna be the presenter, but the topic is the interaction between industry scientists and uh, graduate researchers uh, as they get into their, their ongoing career. So to me, that's been a huge benefit of what's gone. The challenge, as I said, is really to get it going earlier because there is sometimes still, I would say, distrust between the motives of industry versus the motives of academia. I, again, I'm in a very enviable position that my job is, I'm, what do I call, I'm called the Technology and Advocacy Advisor for Emergency Preparedness Response within the Safety, Security, Health, and Environment group of ExxonMobil Corporation. Uh, but this is my full-time job. So I get to go out and talk to people. We just have to figure out how we leverage those interactions more and more and more because we don't want to more or less waste the effort that's going on. For me, the, the job is to try to get the relevance of what's been done. How do we get that into that decision-making decision process? Let's do things that actually add to the, the discussion, and it's these kind of uh, environments that I think really help that. So challenge, get it going earlier, maintain those connectivities. Going forward now, even in post 10 years, I see that continuing. Uh, certainly there are challenges because we do see some publications that come out that get a lot of traction in the press that don't necessarily, in my opinion, help the decision-making process. Sometimes it confounds it. And again, to the extent that we can sort of have those discussions beforehand, especially as research is ongoing or even starting or continuing, it's just what can we do? So 
pluses and minuses, the, the big pluses that industry is here. It took us a few years to get accepted, but I look around the room and I see other people from, whether it's Shell or ExxonMobil or others, we are here and we're happy to be here. So I look forward to an ongoing discussion. Sometimes it's challenging, but we're not afraid of challenges. So thank you. <coughs> thank you. Paul. Hey, well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for having me here. Um, it's a pretty great honor for me. I think my mother would be proud to know I'm talking <laughs> with you folks. Um, oil Spill Response Limited is a, a, a global oil spill response organization. We get our funding from the oil industry, but we've got global responsibilities. We're very involved across the board in Deepwater Horizon, and that range from dispersants to in-situ burning to mechanical recovery of oil and shoreline cleanup. So uh, across the board, what we didn't have then was capping systems for subsea intervention, which we do have now. We have uh, upgraded aircraft and a number of other things. So um, I came into this industry in uh, 1991, and I would say my first decade had to do with building capability to respond in the Caribbean, Latin America, South America. Uh, it was more of an engineering and government liaison function than anything else, managing a, a company. Um, but at the same time, I had foot in both camps. While we were involved with developing systems that were air mobile, could move rapidly, we were also involved in the science. We, we had resurrected the tropics experiment in Panama, the field study, that was originally started in 1984, and in 2001, we decided as an organization to start uh, supporting the science for, uh, for that project, which fed a lot into the NEBA, the Net Environmental Benefit Analysis Science for using dispersants and the relative effects of dispersed and non-dispersed oil. So I, I would say that, uh, you know, with a foot in both camps, I was still not a trained scientist. I had a strong science background from, from college, but that was before a lot of you were born. <laughs> and there's been a lot of uh, uh, advancement since then. What I would say is that um, John will remember that four years ago at the Go Moses conference here in Tampa, I asked him before if we could get together for lunch and, and, and talk a little bit to talk about some of the response community's concerns. And we had uh, lunch, uh, we're, we're trying to figure out where that was. Uh, but I said the concerns are that uh, Gomri in the basic science route is doing a lot of papers that um, industry and the response community doesn't see the relevance of. And I said, we're looking for science to support and inform decision making. As an organization that has the capability to use dispersants or in situ burning, uh, when you have the capability, you also have the responsibility to know how to do it properly, how to do it safely. And while it's not usually our decision on, on the science of it, if you have that capability, you have a responsibility to know what the science is. So we, we talked about that, and, and that was kind of in the early days of looking at the synthesis side. And one of the things at that time, there was not a lot of industry or, or user community inputs into uh, Gomri. Uh, since then, I think, you know, I really appreciate the openness that Gomri had about uh, bringing uh, industry and and response community people in, the interest in understanding that we had uh, uh, some criteria that we were interested in to inform response, and that's generally very uh, holistic. Um, it tends to be more ecosystem than, than individual uh, creature or bacteria or analyte or whatever you want to talk about. Uh, one of the things I said to John was that in the response community, we're not gonna read 50 papers that we don't understand in the first place um, when there's a spill. We need to have synthesized data 
to make that valuable for us. And, uh, and I think the synthesis is going in that direction. Uh, will it get there exactly? Well, I think there's work to be done on both sides uh, to make that, that happen. Uh, one of the things, the shortcomings, I think, of, of Gomery uh, was that the process tended to go, uh, kind of forced its, its uh, hand in the direction of research that came back from uh, offering up grants. There were not a whole lot of things that came back from, from the engineering side of things. And um, I think uh, that's, that's kind of a reality of the process, but maybe the process should have taken into account uh, trying to go out and solicit more, looking for uh, engineering solutions uh, to some of the response and mitigation side of things. Um, I think uh, John said earlier, Doc, Dr. Farrington, who it's been a great pleasure to meet, um, he said, you know, there's cutting edge science, bring it to, this, to the response. And so what I look at in the future uh, is that if there's an oil spill, you're gonna be asked uh, to come to the, to the table, uh, perhaps more than previously. And uh, the question is, can you communicate the, your science and your input effectively to the others? The people who are around the table are highly educated people also, but they're not scientists. They may be engineers, they may be other things. So I think there's a, a big challenge uh, and, and a, a lot of work has been done by other people in communicating science. So, uh, you know, we, we in uh, our side, we, we don't do basic research, but we are quite involved with applied research. And I've been involved with, uh, on the Gomery side, with the Coral Talks and with the CARTH uh, Consortium, which have been very gratifying for me. And it's been great to try to uh, show the scientists what our interests are. Um, but when it comes to the science that we sponsor, and we do sponsor some, you know, we're looking much more at filling gaps and much more at, at the applied side. But I think a lot of what Gomery does has fallen into that capability, that, that, that area. And um, you know, it's a matter for, for people to, to mine it and use it as, as can be done. So Thank having you. said that, I don't mean to say that there have been no engineering advances. A few years ago, as, as part of the, being an advisor with the CARTH II consortium, Tamai asked me, said, Paul, uh, we, we want to know about drifters. Do you have any drifters that, that we could uh, use? And I said, well, Tamai, to be very honest, I purchased drifters in 1995 that were based on 1980s technology in terms of what was known of fluid dynamics. And I said, you've been involved now for almost five years uh, and you have done an awful lot of research on the transport of oil, I would think you could design something much better than anything that we, we had at the time. And he went ahead and did that. So there, there is this engineering advancement, at least in that and other fields I, I I'm have to talk more about another time. So again, I just want to say thank you for uh, including us. I think it was to the advantage of both sides and, and a, a great honor for me to be personally involved. Thank you very much, Paul. And finally, uh, Lisa, on behalf of government agency. Yes, thank you. I also would like to say thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel. Microphone. Myers? I can hear you. <laughs> you hear me in the back? Here. Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. How about that? Thank you. How about that? Okay. Oh. Okay, well, I also just wanted to say thank you for the invitation to sit on this panel and follow some of these world-class scientists that I've had the pleasure of getting to know throughout the l last 10 or more years. Um, I represent, uh, my. I want to 
you know, the characterization was that I represent government. My opinions that I express here are my own personal opinions, and I don't speak on behalf of government or NOAA, the agency. But uh, I did want to say the perspective I bring is from NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration, um, where I uh, was the um, Natural Resource Damage Assessment Senior Scientist. ORNR, as we call it at NOAA's mission, is to protect and restore uh, coastal resources from oil, chemicals, marine debris, and other hazards. And we do this by bringing science uh, to the table uh, to address these problems. So um, that's kind of the perspective I bring in, you know, and I've also had some discussions with a lot of other uh, federal agencies. But some of the highlights for the, uh, the, this 10-year this program here, uh, the primary highlight I think I wanted to, to bring up is the fact that through this program, we've been able to address larger questions and larger scientific challenges and problems than we could have ever tackled as a single government agency or as a single industry science group or as a single academic institution. So I think there's something really strong and powerful to be said, and this demonstration of the scientific community being able to come together and with a strong framework and a strong goal and with intent to be able to work together to try and address some of these significantly challenging scientific questions that, that were uh, put before us as a result of this incident. So this application of an entire scientific community to address a problem under a focused framework, to me, is a very powerful thing that came out of here. It was large scale, it was sustained, and it resulted in a very comprehensive evaluation. And, and we like the range from science, basic science that hasn't you know, been applied science, that ranges from you know, the impacts all the way through the restoration. And that includes both small scale, uh, individual and process e effects versus you know, moving into larger ecosystem level science. So from an from a agency perspective and from our perspective and, and the NERDA and the scientific support we provide for the response, we like that, that kind of cross-disciplinary and broad range science that, that occurred. We liked the independence of this process, and we liked that the science wasn't always tied to an application. So that was very useful for us uh, as a program. And I think people have mentioned, and we also valued the open data and the working towards making the open data compatible with other large data systems. So for the uh, natural resource damage assessment, as many of you know, we made our data open and publicly accessible, and we work very uh, closely with um, the, the Gomri group to, to ensure compatibility. Uh, the conferences, I would like to mention, were also very valuable for us and our teams. They were, became kind of our number one go-to science meetings. It was an opportunity for us from the NERDA perspective and from the response perspective. Uh, we were doing a lot of parallel research, and it was an opportunity to come and see what other scientists were seeing and finding. A opportunity for us to peer review some of our own science that we were conducting in, in support of the damage assessment uh, by vetting it to this large scientific community who were studying the similar geographic uh, and, and ecological situation. And it was also an opportunity for us to hear what other people were finding. So um, may, a lot of times I would come away from this conference and our team of scientists would come away from this conference uh, asking new questions and adding things into our damage assessment or walking away and saying, you know what, maybe you know, th this isn't consistent with other people, with what other people are finding. So it helped us shape our understanding of what was going on in the Gulf of Mexico um, as a result of the spill. So the conferences were really valuable. Uh, people have already mentioned the expanded cadre of scientists that, you know, the new scientists and, and uh, uh, not so new scientists that hadn't worked in an oil spill environment before. So that's been really valuable for us and will continue to be uh, an asset for us on spills in the future. So we've got a new cadre of scientists to draw from who understand what incident command systems are and what it takes to answer questions that support a response and what it takes to not to say to the public and to not say to the public and what, it, what kinds of questions we need answered as part of our agency responsibility. And then uh, tons of new knowledge. I could spend 20 minutes talking about the, the main areas that were supportive for us, but in the interest of time, I guess I'll just close it with maybe the, the challenges I see ahead are maintaining this uh, high level of interest, funding, and relationships that we have with these cross-disciplinary scientists and I think another big challenge is, is going to be uh, transitioning 
keeping this research transitioning into application on spill responses and assessments and restoration moving forward. So thank you again for the opportunity to, to be here. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Uh, and we have a, a, a whole bunch of uh, good questions here, which I've been uh, desperately trying to sort into some sort of coherent uh, order. Um, and we have three that address essentially the same point, so we'll start with those. Um, and th let's put it this way, uh, th I'm paraphrasing here, the next oil spill is not going to be like the last one. What can we do to be prepared for something different. Now, who would like to respond to that? <laughs> um, I guess I'll go. Yeah, sure, yeah. go ahead. So uh, we have this uh, statute on the books called the Oil Pollution Act, um, which uh, came about uh, in the aftermath of the Exxon Valdez spill in, in 89. And I think statutorily, regulatory-wise, we have an opportunity to take what we've learned from this body of work and, and update that act accordingly with respect to response, mitigation, or otherwise. And so that's a direct, I think, policy application of, of Gomery and what we've learned through this, this wonderful process. So I'll just stop there. I'd say from the, uh, the oil industry perspective, uh, certainly there's been a lot of learnings and discussions about what has happened, and I think that's probably very true, that the next one will be different. Uh, we do need to be prepared for it. So having the conversations ahead of time with the interested scientific community, again, is something we can establish, or it's already established, how do we leverage that? And it, for us, it's not just North America. It is global, and a lot of the stuff that we see talked about in these conferences, now there are topics of conversation elsewhere, whether it's in Asia, Africa, Europe, we see a lot of the same things going on. So anything we can do to at least engage early and at least understand the science that was developed over the last 10 years that we didn't have in place before can at least help inform that decision-making process because, uh, as I said, emergency preparedness and response is what we focus on. And it's something that when something happens, we have to be doing something as correctly as possible as soon as we can. So at least we can build on what we know now, knowing that even during an event, whatever it might be, there are still going to be inputs that are going to happen. So helping the academic community understand more about what the industry aspect of the response is, I think has been pretty valuable. That we can't stop and do science as an experiment. We can hopefully parallel things as we are trying to respond, but at least having the engaged uh, individuals already primed, I think, will be a plus. Unless Paul or Lisa really want to jump in on this, <laughs> I'd like to move to the next question. Sure. Uh, but before I do that, could I just remind everybody in the audience that this is specifically one of the synthesis questions. To what extent and how can the knowledge that you have created be transferred to other places, other times, other situations? And it, I think this is one where, in this final year, we really need to work harder than we have so far. And it's partly what we mean by not just a summary, but a synthesis. The transferability is an important part of that. So the next one is to, <coughs> uh, essentially on the, the point that various people, including some of the panelists here, uh, have worked very hard to bring the uh, academic and industry communities together uh, and uh, I think Gumri has, has done a reasonably good job uh, of that, but Gumri is going to end. What can we do to maintain and enhance that in future? So we'll start with Paul and then perhaps move to Lisa. Well, I think uh, the first thing I'd, I'd mention is that I, I look at, at the, this overall oil spill science as four things I call a P2R2, <laughs> prevention, preparedness, response, and restoration, for which we have responsibility for the middle two, preparedness and response. And preparedness is science-based. So even on uh, the day of Deepwater Horizon, there were plans that were science-based on how things would unfold in the Gulf of Mexico if there was uh, this type of incident. And so as we look forward, we're looking for science to 
describe what type of strategies we might use, what's the ecosystem we're operating in, and then I typically look at responses being evidence-based, uh, which is just a twist on the science-based. So as long as we keep, I think, from our perspective, we're comfortable as long as we're using science to inform the response, which essentially means informing planning, in, informing preparedness, and then informing the response itself. So if we can hold science central, I think we're, we're, we can stand up to scrutiny of, of stakeholders, regulators, anybody, and say we think we did the right thing to the degree that there is not a debate about it. Thank you. Lisa? And I think uh, one of the great frameworks we have to continue to make science, you know, relevant and at the forefront of these kinds of decisions. There's the Interagency Coordinating Committee on Oil Pollution Research that, you know, the, the government is, you know, s very active in trying to keep s some of these uh, issues, you know, the newly developing science to the forefront of the discussions across the relevant agencies and also, um, you know, trying to maintain both directly through actively conducting, uh, continuing a lot of this research uh, that you know has started here and filling in some of these research gaps as well as maintaining the awareness of, of others that are doing it in a cross collaborative interdisciplinary uh, way. So I think a lot of our projects moving forward are uh, involving multiple agencies in our in try we're trying to work more collaboratively with industry to kind of keep the science moving together uh, continuously but also maintaining the dialogue about areas where there's, you know, some not full agreement about, you know, what some of the conclusions are. So maintaining the dialogue about areas of uncertainty associated with, you know, the next big one. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have time for one more probably, just about. Um, and that addresses this question of um, trust and, and distrust and uh, mutual skepticism. Um, we know that the early days of the Gumri program were impeded by the, uh, the legal situation, uh, which caused quite a lot of problems for many people involved, not just the uh, independent scientists. But this issue of people not uh, respecting each other's work necessarily that John Farrington mentioned is, I think, a continuing problem. Um, the legal situation we may not be able to do much about, but what can we do to break down the barriers and maintain uh, mutual appreciation of what people in various uh, different uh, communities do in the future? So I'll start with Chris. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't exist in the academic realm. Um, but I can imagine it's a highly competitive in environment. And uh, it I, uh, I think that, um, you know, <coughs> brokering uh, agreements or arrangements among academics to agree to certain goals and, and to um, just work collaboratively together and, and put sort of personal uh, interests, biases aside to come together to solve a, a broader, larger question. Um, I think that that's really key and to just give one another credit where credit's due and have some basic principles under which you operate collaboratively with other academics. So it's all very transparent. It's on paper. Um, those are my questions. So I do sort of live in the science world and it's interesting for me coming from the industry science part and then dealing with the academic um, professionals as well. And I was just talking to somebody last night, and we are, in many cases, we are scientists. We came, we're product of academia. So we know what academia is, and yes, it is a very highly competitive, uh, the last thing, uh, one of the most competitive things you'll ever see is when you're in the final phase of doing your PhD, and a publication comes out from somebody else that, that is awfully close to what you've been writing up. And that's when you realize, I gotta get this done. Uh, so ha working, we do have a very similar background in some ways, it's just, Okay, I've been in the industry now for 30 years. But it's that transparency and trust and just recognizing the, the pedigree we have. Uh, I got my PhD from Caltech, so it was nice to see that there's a fellow alumnus here, or alumna here. Uh, so we do have that pedigree in many ways, and it's getting together and having a chance to talk about it. But it is the respect 
of what comes. We may not agree with some of the conclusions or the assumptions that went into it, but the respect of the scientific method that goes into the work that the Gomri Consortia has done, I think, is uh, uh, certainly proven. So. Okay, we're out of time, Paul, so I'm afraid <laughs> I'm going to have to uh, <laughs> close it down. But thank you very much for your questions, and I'm sorry if we didn't get to, to yours. But just to follow on from what uh, Tom just said, um, I, I spent 20 years of my career working for a government uh, agency on, on applied problems, and my experience is that applied problems lead to very interesting science a lot of the time and it is horrifying how easy it is to get to the frontiers of knowledge. So my message to those who are currently uh, academic researchers is don't be afraid to get your hands dirty with applied research. There's a lot of interesting fundamental stuff that still remains to be done that you will be confronted with a lot sooner than you expect. So with that note, thank you very much to our panelists, all of you, for responding so succinctly and uh, pertinently to our questions. We have been recording what you said, and we are going to try and capture that. <laughs> they were warned <laughs> for the future. Uh, but if you have uh, other views on this issue, uh, please let me know, and we will try and feed those into the synthesis of what has been said today. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you.